Hi everyone and welcome back. My name is Frank Sullivan, we're a digital craftsman and today I have an extra special guest all the way from the very top of the food chain, Simon Wilcox, Hi. the Managing Director. Simon, hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good. This will be our fifth video in the series and thanks for taking some time out of the business to talk to your marketing department no today. Problem. Um, the last four videos we did a deep dive in, into security. We looked mm -hmm. at identity and access management, we looked at um, the evolving uh, IT supply chain and how MSPs, mm -hmm. how service providers manage the complexity of, of an outsourced IT supply chain. And then we did a bit of a deep dive into um, security architecture and the security mindset. What I'd really like to talk about today is to close off that series. It's to look at a much higher level strategic view of security across the organization. Mm -hmm. It's looking at being a technologist, not a, an engineer. Mm -hmm. So I guess my first question to you would be, how do you view security from a leadership level? Um, security has to be now at the very board level. Um, I don't think we can uh, exist with the time that we had previously where uh, everything could be pushed down to, uh, down to IT people. Um, it's now a company-wide issue. Mm. Um, there are uh, director penalties for getting it wrong. GDPR has quite some onerous, onerous penalties. So really, security is something that has to come down to the board level. Um, as, as you're well aware, over the last 10 years, we've, we've moved away from centralized IT to decentralized IT. And one of the biggest behavioral problems is that even decentralized IT needs centralized coordination. How, how do you view the role of the MSP uh, as, as, the, as the sort of nerve center for security? And is security as a service something that should be delivered by an MSP? It's certainly something that can be delivered by an MSP. Um, I think the, we can act, an MSP can act as a gatekeeper very effectively mm -hmm. and guardian of the, of the rules. Um, we can help to establish the rules. Obviously, we know a lot about governance and, uh, um, and, the, and the correct procedures to put into place. Um, but I think we also uh, we can act as a very nice barrier between a barrier separation between um, internal and external, between one mm -hmm. rule and another rule, so that we make sure that we have um, you know that, that those things are, are kept kept separate, yeah. um, well looked after, and, and owned um, across the business. So let let me pick up on those those two points. The first um, is very much around being uh, the person to advise on governance, yep. setting in place policies and procedures exactly that. that deal with compliance, and then enabling those policies to enforce governance mm -hmm. or enforce transparency or confidentiality and security across the organization. But there's, so there's a softer aspect to that, and that's, that's the... Um, the people and the culture of the business, if it's not particularly geared towards mm -hmm. the security mindset, what kind of risks does that mm -hmm. bring into the business? One of the most common routes of attack now is the phishing email. So um, the, the borders are quite well secure now. Um, pretty much everyone implements uh, a firewall or some description or another, mm -hmm. usually pre proof from people trying to break in directly through that. Um, as long as your external servers have um, patching and so on all kept up to date then you're unlikely to, to have a problem being attacked there. Um, so they've moved the focus of their activities now to the people within the business. Um, so a phishing email will attempt to get your username and password mm -hmm. or uh, uh, attempt to drop some, get through your, uh, your uh, email scanning and drop some kind of malware on your, on your machine so they can take it over and then they can, they can access your machine. Those things now are, are you know, technology, technology solves part of it and that we can trap certain things, but we can't trap everything. Um, so it really does require the, the involvement of everybody to help keep everything safe. Um, in one of the previous videos we discussed with Mikkel, the difference between security and safety. Mm -hmm. Security being a prophylactic approach, a mm -hmm. prevention uh, priority versus how to actually respond to incidents. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that, that concept. And, and you said being the, 
um, the Guardian governance, mm -hmm. that, that would appear to be one side of the, the spectrum where you're in the trusted advisor position. Yep. The customer, their CI was listening to you, they're taking advice on policy, identity, access management, and, and those governance mm -hmm. rules from their MSP. But let's go to the, the opposite end of the spectrum. So you go from being a guardian of governance to a custodian of data, yep. where you see the, the role of the managed services provider as the custodian of data. How can that actually help to enforce security across a pretty complicated supply chain? Uh, well, in that instance, what we can do is um, you've got a set of data, you need to keep that data safe, you need to make that data available to yeah. a number of third parties. Um, and you need to make that, depending on the confidentiality of that data, you need to track how it's been disclosed to who it's been sent and so on. Um, and having a centralised place where you can do that makes life much easier from an audit point of view, from mm -hmm. a compliance point of view. Um, and having an MSP to do, do that means you've got some very clear um, lines of responsibility. You've got potentially some, some legal contractual basis um, for that um, so that you are in effect transferring some of the risk of managing that to a third party um, because they're contractually taking on a risk, which is not necessarily the case um, with an internal uh, function. If you've got internal people looking after it, they have their job description and so on, um, but it's very much on your shoulders if something goes wrong. Um, if you outsource that, that responsibility to a third party, there are other contractual um, uh, mechanisms in place to, yeah. uh, to, to warrant that that service is going to be performed properly. And that, that obviously has an impact on what kind of service level agreement you Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know, we range of service levels from, from basic UAT ones right up to 24-7, highly, highly secure, um, particularly for certain types of data, you know, personal identifiable information. GDPR now has a massive impact on that, so we need to make sure that that data is, is secured uh, in an auditable and maintainable way. I think s certainly over the last couple of months, one of the internal conversations that Simon and I have been having has gone beyond being guardian of governance and data custodian, one being the, the trusted advisor as opposed to being the trusted doer. I think one of the other big, big challenges that, that, that we've been discussing has been around what we've affectionately termed type one and type two businesses. Type one businesses being um, seeing IT services contract, uh, contracts as, as fixed as linear um, and, and not particularly open to agile mm -hmm. process, they get stuck in the past versus type two businesses or businesses on their way to becoming type two that are looking at IT as something cyclical, something that happens every quarter, um, something that is continuously improved. Mm -hmm. When it comes to helping a customer understand how to become a type two business, certainly from a security perspective. What would you tend to recommend? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I guess, you know, bo boiling it down, there, there's one view that says innovate at all costs. Mm -hmm. You know, spin up your platforms to help with security, give the junior developers <laughs> credit cards, you know, yeah, you let them go wild. We wouldn't really recommend that. I mean, there has to be a balance, I think, between um, between centralised control and enabling the kind of modern technologies that, that, that people are using now. And one way of doing that um, is through something like a consolidated billing account, where everything mm -hmm. comes back to one place, and through establishing standards for the developers to make sure that they're, that they're, used, that they're following the right, the right processes and to make sure that costs and security are controlled, um, and perhaps even down to, to audit for those things to make sure that we understand you know, whether those things have been done, have been done correctly. Um, so I think that's, that's one side of it. Um, I think the other side is, is potentially around um, establishing that centre of excellence for cloud computing so that people are, um, you know, people are coming to you for that, for that advice and we're regularly training uh, people. Um, and joining that up with some, some predetermined standards in terms of um, a, a defining the, the tagging plan, for instance, defining the, the minimum security model, for instance, making sure that everything has multi-factor authentication enabled, all of those basic rules um, are, are, you know, starts to move people towards um, a controlled environment but where you can still iterate and develop quickly. Um, I'm going to ask you a tough, tough question. 
um, but something that you know the more savvy customers um, among our portfolio would ask. I'm saying, if you're helping them establish a cloud center of excellence mm -hmm. and training them up in DevOps, understanding cloud optimization, understanding um, how to do cloud right, mm -hmm. are you not taking away your own margin opportunity or your <coughs> own opportunity to manage it on their behalf? Um, yes and no. I think when the companies that we're working with at the moment tend to find that um, a lot of that work is quite um, bread and butter. It doesn't really add to the IP of the company um, and they're not necessarily interested in running that themselves. Uh, the software that they're developing that they're putting on the cloud, the business processes that they're enabling through cloud technologies, those things are the things that are really adding value and they don't necessarily want to have to go through the, uh, the kind of recruitment chain um, and, and, and get people in, pay the fees, manage them, develop them, all of that kind of stuff. Um, when they can get someone to buy in that service, because it's quite definable as a service. Mm. Um, but yes, in some cases, certainly, yeah, we're, we're training people to do that. But we, you know, we believe there's a long-term relationship to be had with all of our customers. Um, and by sharing, you know, sharing that knowledge, we get, you know, there are other areas that we can that we can help people help people with, even if they don't want to take that, you know, take take on those managed services. So there's there's always plenty of work to be done. And in terms of helping customers transition to the cloud. I mean, one of, one of, one of the, the great philosophical debates that, that, that we've had internally over the last six months has been go all in on public mm -hmm. cloud, yep. have some sort of stepping stone with hybrid cloud, but I think, I think we've both kind of landed in, in, in a middle ground where a lot of workloads are not suitable for public cloud. Yeah or the customer requirements, uh, not because they're not a modern, sophisticated mm -hmm. organization, they're just fundamentally not suitable for public cloud. Yep. I know there are some other cloud fanatics out there who are going to turn me down on this, but give me some practical examples that I could go back to them with and say, um, you shouldn't be in public cloud, you should stay in the data center, or you should, you, you should buy managed hosting. Yep. Who are those people? Um, well, there are some, some people are running um, what we might call legacy applications, where they're very yeah. much very Good much point. tied to individual servers. Um, they may have a key or a dongle or, or a software license that requires a particular MAC address and things like that, um, which means that they're not usually very suitable taking into the cloud. Even with reserved instances, they can still end up being quite expensive. Um, and and really, public cloud is ideally suited to systems that can horizontally scale. Um, where you can bring um, instances in and out to cope co with load and so on, whereas a lot of legacy uh, enterprise systems are really kind of vertically scalable, so you just make the machines bigger and bigger and bigger mm. to cope with the load. They're expected to last for a long time. Um, and a phrase we picked up somewhere on the internet really is the difference between pets and cattle. Um, lots of legacy enterprise applications really need to be treated like pets. They need to be looked after and fed and watered and, 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 and if they get ill you have to make them better. Whereas when you're dealing with cattle um, in, the, in, in the data in a public cloud environment, they're designed to be very consistent, they're very similar. Um, and if one of them gets sick, you get rid of it and you, um, and, and you get another one. Um, so they're, they're different, slightly different mindsets in terms of how they're, how they're progressing. The industry itself is moving. Um, more and more software providers now, software authors, are moving towards kind of cloud first, that kind of that cloud native kind of application. But there's still a huge body of enterprise systems that, that, that aren't suitable for, for that kind of ephemeral public cloud action. Very well put. Thank you very much. I would guess the, fi the final question, or at least the penultimate question here, to extend the, the cap cattle analogy. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the metaphorical bolt gun. <laughs> Serverless. How can large enterprise cloud consumers with many distributed teams, many distributed workloads, probably don't have a good handle on um, the, the overall cloud estate. How can they begin to use other microservices? How can they begin to use <coughs> serverless Lambda functions um, um, of course, yeah. I mean, of, of course, in, you know? of course, they're not really serverless. Of course, they're just code that's running on someone else's function computer. As a service. So it's functions as a service. Um, a lot of the security issues that arise with instances 
um, also arise with um, microservices in terms of authentication, knowing that they're there, um, orchestrating all of those things, making sure that you're shutting down and, make, and, and removing from service old versions of those, um, and ensuring that you um, that, that everything is properly is properly secured. So you can break into you can break into an application um, probably as easily through serverless as you can through um, through instances if they're not properly if they're not properly managed. Um, but we use them ourselves. We use them for some features um, to, to support some features of, of systems where it just makes perfect sense to do that. And smaller microservices, if you're building very big systems and you're using lots of microservices, then yeah, serverless is probably a good way to go. Particularly if they're very if they're very spiky um, in, in their need in their load. But um, but again, the, but the, but at an enterprise level, the orchestration tools for those things, for monitoring them, to making sure they're doing the right thing. Um, to make sure that they're properly secure, to make sure that the cost management is there uh, and the security is there. The tools for that aren't quite there yet. I think we're probably another year, 18 months away before those, those tools will be, will be completely ready for it. There are, they are there, but they're yeah. in, in an early stage. And they don't necessarily integrate very well with the existing management systems that you might have in place. My final question, promise, my final question. You need to understand how organizations, large organizations, have begun to implement um, new DevOps methodologies. They've begun to start experimenting in the cloud a couple of years ago. Um, as we know, cloud markets, public cloud markets, mature. You know, some of the offerings that AWS and, and, and Azure have come out with are indicative of that um, enterprise users and enterprise application owners are choosing public cloud mm -hmm. uh, over private cloud or yeah. over on-prem <coughs> uh, for the first time mm -hmm. ever. That's become the majority, or the, the not the majority, the default operating model. It's now cloud versus non-cloud. Mm -hmm. That pressure to innovate and to roll out new services and to always be on the cutting edge, always be ahead of this sort of digital transformation agenda, some of the cynics among us think it, it's nonsense, others just think it should be rebranded as change management. <laughs> Let's say that you started off this program five years ago, this change management program. You want to bring everything, drag everything kicking and screaming into the 21st century, mm -hmm. <laughs> microservice by microservice. That, prolifer that, that uncontrolled proliferation of resources over time is what we would call cloud spot. Yeah. And I think this is one of the one of the great evils of public cloud, and it's got nothing to do with the cloud provider. It has everything to do with the behavior or the lack of organization around deploying, tagging, managing, yep. auditing yep. infrastructure. So I'm going to leave our audience with one thing. What would be your top recommendation to begin to attack cloud sprawl as an issue across your business? Um, first thing to do is to get some kind of analysis done. So, um, you know, before you know where you're going to go, you need to know where you are. So, I would go with a, uh, a health assessment, um, taking a look at that billing data, looking for underutilized or, um, or, or even over overutilized in some cases, but certainly looking to right size all of the instances that you've got, get a handle on where everything is, um, look for the instances that are you know, orphaned storage, for instance, is, uh, is a common one um, where a, a instance is terminated but the storage hangs around, you're paying for that storage whether you're using it or not. Um, and, and so, yeah, a cloud, a, a cloud assessment, health assessment would, be a, would certainly be the first place to start. And in terms of right-sizing infrastructure, is that something that people should actively be looking for? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, uh, if you're not... If you're not looking to make the, these things the right size, then you're then you're probably paying too much um, for that. Uh, I, I saw someone uh, tweet the other day where someone said it's you know it's, it's not about worrying about what's on, it's about worrying about what you haven't switched off. Um, <laughs> Horizontal so scalability yeah, has its drawbacks. Exactly so. So it's made, it's very important to make sure that that is done and ideally done in an active way. So. So um, you know, obviously some, some loads, if you look at them at a point in time, they're not busy because it's not month end, and when month end comes, it runs. But then again, should you be switching those machines off if they're not used at that, you know, through, through, the, through the month? So um, definitely there's a, there's a thing to do from an active, um, you know, kind of active monitoring over a period of time. Well, folks, that's, uh, that's all we've got time for. As ever, Simon, I'd like to thank you, thank you. 
Pleasure. For being on your own TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.